Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Ioane Nienkemper-Swanepoel, and she started her academic career at the University of the Free State in Bloemfontein, where she obtained her BSc, BSc Honours, and her MSc in Mathematical Statistics with distinction. She joined Stellenbosch University in 2013 as an Applied Statistics Lecturer in the Department of Genetics for students following agricultural programs, and she obtained her PhD in Mathematical Statistics in 2019 from the University of Stellenbosch. Her research interests focus on missing data analysis and multidimensional scaling, specifically by plot visualization. She is currently a lecturer at the Statistics and Actuarial Science Department at Stellenbosch University, where she is also a member of an active project team focusing on advanced research in the field of multidimensional data visualization. And today she'll be joining us to present her work on multiple correspondence analysis applications for missing data visualization. So Yuane, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diane. Thanks. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the lovely introduction and everything that you've said is true. <laughs> so I don't have to repeat anything, including the title. Um, thank you so much for joining. I really do hope that you will enjoy today's session and maybe take something from it. I want to say a special welcome to some of my family members. Um, these type of webinars um, make it, you know, um, it enables us to also share our academic work with our families. So thank you so much to them also for joining today. It's a very special opportunity for me. So today I'm going to share some of the highlights really from my PhD. Um, so yes, the focus will be on multiple correspondence analysis specifically for missing data visualizations. So first I feel I have to kind of convince you that this is a relevant problem. Um, so I give you a few reasons why I think this is important. So. Missing data is really unavoidable for any data related disciplines. I, I know that some people would just ignore the missing data, but it's really um, something that could contribute to your um, analysis if it's handled in the correct way. So it's very important to understand how to deal with this. And I think it's a crucial skill for any data analyst to know how to handle your missing data. So that's the missing data part. Then why do I want to visualize things? So I've got this uh, for me, it's a famous quote by Tuki, and it says the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. Now, especially for my case, the visualization of missing data, this is something that we of course do not expect to be able to see because it is missing, it's unobserved. So this is especially true, I think, for the applications you'll see today. And then I also feel that visualizations make data more accessible to a wider audience because it's not, you know, mathematical or and it, it kind of takes the barriers away of scientific language and it's not as complex as would be if you just see a calculation or a data table. So the visualizations make it more approachable, I, I feel. And then lastly, again, back to this missing data problem. Maybe if you haven't worked with missing data, um, a lot, you, but you wouldn't know this, but there are limited exploratory analysis techniques suitable for missing data. And exploratory analysis techniques here refers to visualizations. So that is just my way of kind of motivating you why you should not um, go on with something else. You should focus on the presentation. Maybe one of these points did spark some interest. So I'm going to break down this title that I have for today in the three core concepts. So first, just a bit on missing data to give you some background information that you'll need for the methodology that we'll discuss later. So missing data occurs due to a random process referred to as the missing data mechanism. And in short, I'll just refer to the MDMs. Now there are three MDMs. Um, typically this first one missing at random is the one that is assumed for most data sets, especially questionnaires. And this is when we assume that the missing observations are independent of the other missing observations, but they do depend on the observed information. Now, this means that we can um, use the observed information to try and impute, and I'll get to that, but to try and understand at this stage, let's say to try and understand the missing values because there is a dependency on the observed information. So that's missing at random. Then missing completely at random, this is when our missing observations are independent, independent of all the variables, so missing or observed. So this is quite an extreme case. Um, if you're familiar with sampling techniques, this would be similar to just taking a simple random sample from your population. 
So it's a completely random mechanism of missingness. And then the last one is quite difficult to work with. It's the missing not at random. And this is where our missing values depend on missing information. So this could be due to a response that is missing, or it could be due to a question that is not observed in the survey. So that is the missing not at random case. And in this presentation, I'll only focus on these missing at random and missing completely at random mechanisms. So imputation, um, as you can maybe also understand already from the word is that it means to replace missing observations with plausible response values. So I'm not going to go into detail. I just want to kind of make you aware of the fact that there are two branches of this. So we have single imputation and then multiple imputation. And I think a lot of people have already used single imputation, for example, by just replacing an observation with the mean of the observed observations. So that is a form of single imputation, specifically mean imputation. So that's when you replace each missing value with one plausible value. So this means that you are um, going to result with a completed data set, only one completed data set. And I've um, indicated this in bold that D because when we work with missing data techniques, there is of course a difference between the complete data set and the completed data set. So the completed data set tells us that something happened. We've changed the data set in some way. So once you have this completed set, you can perform any standard complete case analysis. But you can just think if you're only going to replace that missing value with one plausible value, you are going to underestimate the variation. So in general, single imputation techniques are biased techniques, even though they are very easy to use, they might not be the best route. So the superior technique is to use multiple imputation. As you can see, multiple now refers to not just a replacing, um, replacing a value with one value, but now replacing each missing value with multiple plausible values. So now we'll have multiple completed data sets and you will repeat your standard an analysis on each of these completed sets. So then you'll have a set of results which you have to combine and we combine that using Rubin's rules. And this is a more realistic representation because now we have a distribution of plausible values. So we won't be underestimating the variation. So I'm not going to try and convince you even more. I'm just going to tell you <laughs> that I'm going to use multiple imputation and to show you how to deal with multiple imputed data sets in an exploratory analysis. So just a summary of what I've just said about multiple imputation. So you'll start with a missing data set. So you'll have some missing observations. And then for this example, I'm just going to impute three times. So I have a multiple imputation with three imputed data sets. So I've completed data sets on which I can perform any analysis. So now I have three sets of results and then I'm going to combine the results. So the aim of multiple imputation is never to combine the data sets. We want to combine the estimates from the analysis. So that's very important to keep that in mind. The aim is definitely not to obtain one completed data set. And I think this is something that um, kind of makes people, um, they don't want to use this because it is, it seems like a lot of extra work because now you have 10 analyses, whereas you would have maybe preferred just to perform the one. But in today's um, day and age where we have, you know, enough computational power on our side, this is not really a drawback anymore. So that's just a bit of background on missing data. Then really a brief introduction to what is multiple correspondence analysis. I'm really not going to make today's talk technical. Um, I want to show you the visualizations in a bit. So this is a multivariate categorical data analysis technique. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, we're going to start just with correspondence analysis. So this is where you have two categorical variables and these variables have multiple category levels. So possible response levels. And they are summarized in what we call a contingency table. So they just contain the cross tabulations of your categorical variables, the two variables. So correspondence analysis is a dimension reduction technique which relies on singular value decomposition, SVD as is the case with most um, multidimensional scaling techniques. So the aim here would be to display a multidimensional data set in a lower dimension, typically two dimensions, but we can of course also visualize in three dimensions. 
Then for multiple correspondence analysis, this is the extension of the two categorical variable analysis. So now we extend CA to several categorical variables. So there are again, various ways of approaching MCA. For um, today's talk, I will be following the approach where we apply correspondence analysis on an indicator matrix. And an indicator matrix is just a coded multivariate data set or sorry, a coded multivariate matrix, which consists of zeros and ones. So the dummy variables, and I'll show you an example of that also. So I'm going to, um, what's well, not advertising is just giving you the citation. So I'm going to refer to the CA package in R. If you haven't performed correspondence analysis or MCA, you can definitely give this package a go. Um, and there's also the article in the Journal of Statistical Software as reference. So within that package, I just have a subset of this data set. So Western German, German survey taken in 93. And I just show the first 10 rows and then the categorical variables, four categorical variables. And you can see that they have five response categories and they are coded as one, two, three, four, and five. And if you just quickly glance over the subset, you'll see one, two, three, four, and five. Um, so these are the response levels. And just on what I refer to these elements, um, the rows refer to, we refer to as the samples and they um, represent the individuals or the participants completing a survey. And then the columns we refer to as the variables. And these category va um, categorical variables have category levels, as I've said. So variable A has five category levels, B has five category levels, and so on. So now to represent this as an indicator matrix, we are going to create a column for each of these category levels. So if we just look at these column headings, it says A1, A2, A3, up until A5, and the same for each of these categorical variables. So now we've expanded this data matrix to an indicator matrix where we have a column for each of the category levels, and we still represent our samples in the rows. So what the indicator matrix does is it shows us which response level was selected. So for the sample one, for variable A, a second category level was selected. So therefore a one is replaced in the column referring to the second category level of variable A. If it did not select a particular level, a zero appears. So we can see zero, one, zero, zero, zero. And this is then coded for each of the responses. So this is the indicator matrix on which we will perform the analysis. So as I've said, correspondence analysis is performed on the indicator matrix. And I promised it wouldn't be technical. So what we do is we weight our indicator matrix G similar to the one that you've just seen. And these weightings are based on the totals of the rows and the columns of the indicator matrix. So we perform standard um, singular value decomposition, SVD, on this weighted indicator matrix. So this gives us the result where our weighted indicator matrix is now expressed as these three matrices, so the SVD solution. So singular value decomposition is just, it's a very powerful and compact, compact technique for dimension reduction. Um, if you've worked with it before, you would know that it's a lower rank approximation of a high dimensional data set, which is perfect. That's exactly what we need. Um, so just so that you're aware, it can um, decompose a rectangular matrix into these three matrices. And then we have um, our left and right singular vectors in our U and our V matrices that you see there. And on the diagonal in the sigma matrix, we have the singular values. And the singular values are in decreasing order and the largest singular values carries the most variation. So we would use the largest singular values as the best approximation lower approximation of our high dimensional problem. So that's just, uh, let's say a crash course into SVD there. Okay, so we've already learned something about missing data and now something about MCA and now something about visualization will follow. So the visualizations I refer to today will refer to by plots. Now by plots are generalized scatter plots. So we know scatter plot is a two dimensional um, visualization. We have two axes and then we've got our points that are scattered in between these axes. So the by in by plots refers to two modes of data. So samples and variables that are displayed in the same display. 
but here we are not restricted to only two variables as we were in the case of a standard scatter plot. So what the biplot does is, it, is it's, it gives us a global overview of high dimensional data, again, in a lower approximation, so two or three dimensional space. And here we will emphasize the importance of relationships between samples and variables. And the distances between these coordinates that we will see in the plot will tell us something about the relationship between the responses. Um, so in a categorical biplot, we won't have axes. I'll show you the difference now. We'll have two types of coordinate sets. We'll have a sample coordinate set and a category level point coordinate set. And this category level point refers to the various category levels that we looked at. So if we go back to this one, the category levels refer to these columns in the indicator matrix. So we'll have a point for each of those category levels. Ooh. And as I've said, the positioning of these coordinates are important. So the closer they are, the more strongly they are associated. So the distances are crucial in this biplot interpretation. So just to give you an idea of the difference between a continuous and a categorical biplot, I just have these two examples. Um, I'm just going to zoom in a bit for this. So um, this is definitely not the aim of the talk today. So I'm just going to tell you for a continuous case, you can use a principal component analysis biplot, the PCA biplot. And for this example, we have four variables and we have, I think it was 21 um, samples. So it may, maybe looks a bit complex, but now in a traditional scatter plot, you would have only had two axes. Now we have these four axes and the placement of the axes tell us something about the relationship of the variables. And then also the points we can project to our axes. Let's go to this one. So by drawing a perpendicular line from each point to the axes, you can read off the value on the calibrated axes. So that's very similar to how you would use a scatter plot, but now this is expanded to a multivariate visualization. So that is the, um, let me just go back. So that is the continuous biplot. We will be focusing on the categorical biplot. So here we can see on the right, we don't have axes. Here we have the two types of coordinates, as I've said. So we have, we have these triangles, which represent the category level points. And then these open circles represent the sample coordinates. And the placement again, the proximity between points are important and tells us how strongly samples are associated and also how associated they are with a particular response level. So I've color coded these samples. Oh, sorry. So if we focus on this sample, which I've now indicated with a black solid circle and the purple triangles refer to the response levels. So the category levels that this individual did indicate in the survey. And it's not always easy to interpret them, but this, if it was a perfect approximation, our sample would be in closest proximity to these category levels. And when I say um, a particular category level, you have to compare the, the variable with its levels. So I hope you can spot them quickly. So this is C1. So we have to find all the other Cs. So there's C5, C4, C3, and there we have C2. So hopefully you would find the category level is in closest proximity to your sample. But again, it's an approximation. So sometimes in the full dimensional space, they would be the closest points, but um, this is an approximation. So that's just roughly the idea behind the interpretation. Um, for biplot construction in general, you would perform um, singular value decomposition on your data matrix if it's um, a continuous case, or you would perform SVD on your weighted indicator matrix if it's a categorical case, as I've shown you. Once you've done the singular value decomposition, you will plot the first two columns of your principal coordinates. So this is from the SVD solution, and this will represent your samples. Now for the variable representation or the columns of your matrix, you would plot the first two columns of V. And the reason for the first two columns, that's for the two dimensional approximation. So in the case of our PCA biplot that we saw, we had calibrated axes. And then in the case of the MCA biplot, we had category level points. 
And then there are various ways of scaling these parameters depending on how you want to use the byproduct. So um, this is really just a general idea to show you how it works, but it can become quite technical, of course. So again, back to um, our Western German sample that I showed you. So what you see here, this is how I've plotted the two columns. So the sample coordinates is represented here by the product you see here. So all of these gray open circles. And then the second set of coordinates um, refers to this product you see here, and that is the category level points. So I've indicated another sample now, sample 15, and just showing you that here the approximation is, well, it looks quite good because we can see that these purple triangles are in closest proximity to sample 15. And then we can see these are the responses of individual 15 for these questions. Um, category level three was selected for variable A and so on. So that is how you can use the approximation using the visualization. And of course, a sample that is close to sample 15, these samples will be associated. So we would expect them to have the same responses. So um, that's how you could interpret that. So that is the background part. Let's see how we're doing. Um, so I have two main ideas that I want to share with you. The first is how to combine visualizations. And with visualizations, I refer to MCA pie plots. How do I combine them if I've performed multiple imputation? And then secondly, perhaps you are a bit afraid of multiple imputation. And then I'll show you, okay, there is another alternative which does not require imputation. Um, but I'll show you the benefits of these techniques. So firstly, um, I'm not going to um, explain the multiple imputation technique that I've used. Um, this is the paper where you can read up on it. It's called the MIMCA algorithm, which refers to multiple imputation using multiple correspondence analysis. Again, back to the theme of today. So MCA is also applied in the multiple imputation technique. Now I'm going to show you a simulated data set. And when working with multiple, uh, with missing data techniques, it is essential to work with simulated data so that you have something to refer back to. So we would simulate data and then delete data according to a specific mechanism as we've discussed in the beginning. And then we would try our missing data techniques and then we would refer our um, analysis back to what the complete case analysis would have been. So firstly, I'm going to show you here, well, a lot of the slides will be on the same data set. So this was initially simulated from a uniform distribution. We have a thousand samples. We have five categorical variables and they're varying levels. And then I've deleted 10% of the observations using a missing at random mechanism. So this is the mechanism where our missing values depend on the observed values. That's the mechanism. Okay, so I'm not showing you all the steps. So I'm telling you, we've simulated it, we've deleted the values, and then we applied multiple imputation using MIMCA, and we've applied 10 multiple imputations. After that, we had our 10 completed sets, and then we performed MCA on them, and we've visualized them. So this is where we are now. I'm going to zoom in in a bit, just to show you, we have 10 visualizations. Each of them represent a specific, specific multiple imputation. And as I've said, we've done 10 multiple imputations. So I'm going to zoom in. Let's look at this last panel, the lower panel. So you can see it's, this is the multiple imputation number eight, nine, and 10, as it says, says there in the legend. I've left out the sample labels just to make it easier to see. So Generally, we see the same pattern. Of course, this is a reflection of the other two. We can see about the y-axis, but we do see similarities in the positioning of these triangles and the positioning of these samples. So yes, we see similarities. So the thing of multiple imputation is we want to capture the uncertainty. So we want a realistic representation of the variation. So that means there should be some variation, but we don't want these multiple imputations to complete, you know, be completely different from one another. They should still be similar, but they should have a variation. So this is exactly what we see. The point of this is I can now interpret each of these visualizations, write a summary. Hopefully each of those 10 summaries will correlate in some way. 
So it's an impossible task. That's the point. It's impossible to write 10 summaries and then combine them in a sense. We want to combine these 10 visualizations to get an unbiased representation of what we see on this slide. So to show you again the problem, if we superimpose the category level points so all of those triangles onto one display, they are not, we saw that some of them are reflections. So this is again um, shown in this left panel. So we, this is not usable, that's the point. So what we did as a first step is to obtain the centroid configuration, which is just the mean of each of these 10 multiple imputations. And this is indicated here with the black squares. So now this is the centroid configuration. Again, the average of the category level points from the 10 imputations. So that is step one. And then I want to say that the solution is then, and I'm going to show you that now, is the GPA bin algorithm. And um, GPA stands for Generalized Orthogonal Procrustes Analysis. And the bin is for Rubin's rules that I briefly discussed at the beginning. So to combine estimates from multiple imputations. So um, there will be a lot more detail in this paper. Um, and it's also in the reference list if you maybe want to look at that after the presentation. So it seems as if I'm jumping. I just want to say, if I go back, this is the part that we want to combine. This step is to show you we have a centroid configuration. So what we want to do is match each of these panels that you see here to the centroid configuration. So it's, we will have a target configuration and we will match each of our configurations to the target configuration. And I'm just saying that again, because procrastus analysis allows us to compare two configurations. Um, I'm going to expand on it in a bit, but just to show you the idea behind procrastus, it allows us to perform translation, rotation, reflection, and scaling by still preserving the um, relationships between the coordinates. So it starts with uh, configuration A. I'm saying configuration, but I'm just referring to this figure that you see, and it has four coordinates. We see A1, A2, A3, A4, and then we have a shape B, also a configuration with four coordinates, B1, B2, and so on. And we want to match B to A. So A is the target configuration. So we want to match B1 to A1, B2 to A2, and so on. So we can see that we have to perform a few steps here in order to match them. So for the translation step, we don't have to perform that because they're already centered. Both of these configurations are centered. And then we're going to perform a reflection. So we see we flip this configuration so that we have um, the B1 and the A1s on the same side and the A2 and the B2 on the same side. And then we're going to rotate the configuration and lastly, perform a scaling so that they are stretched um, to the, the points are stretched, the B points are stretched to the A points. So these are the um, transformations that we apply using orthogonal procrastus analysis in order to match a configuration to a target configuration. So this idea can be extended to more than two configurations. And that's, of course, the problem that we have. We have 10 configurations, which we want to map or match to the centroid configuration. So for that, we use GPA, generalized procrastus analysis. And I've added these arrows to show you the changes that happen. Again, this last panel shows everything that we need to see. So we see the reflection and the rotation. The scaling is not as easy to see, but there is all of those transformations are happening within the GPA algorithm. So it's an iterative process. I'm not going to show you any formulas on that, but the idea remains the same where we apply those um, transformations in order to match a configuration to a, a certain target configuration. So now we've performed GPA on each of these 10 configurations. And now we have aligned all of our biplots. So we can see now we don't have those reflections anymore. And we see similar patterns of our um, category level points and of our sample points. And again, we have variation and I'm just zooming in again on this panel. With variation, I mean, we see a general pattern of the CLPs, uh, but we see some movement around the positioning of the points. So we do have variation.
but they are now more comparable than they were before. So this of course is still not the end goal. We want one configuration. So showing you again what we had, this was the superimposed before applying any procrustes. This was just the MCA biplots. And then on the right, I now have superimposed the transformed CLPs. So definitely this is something that we can work with. We see the variation around the points you can see here, but they are definitely comparable. They are situated in the same region. Okay. So what we've done then is to obtain the GPA bin biplot is to take the centroid then of the aligned biplots. So these 10 configurations are then combined. Their coordinate sets are combined into a mean configuration, which we then call the GPA bin biplot. Now, I hope you're still with me. It seems as if I said a lot of things and I showed a lot of configurations, but I hope that you could kind of understand where I'm going with this. So on the left, we have the complete data set. So the simulated data set before I've deleted 10% of the observations. So this is what we want to recreate and we want to preserve the relationships observed in the complete pie plot. Then in the completed case where we've performed multiple imputation 10 times, we've constructed our biplots and then we aligned them and combined them. And then we've arrived, arrived at the GPA bin biplots. So we can see again, similarities between the placement of category level points. And with that, I really just mean there's D2 and I see it's similarly placed in my GPA bin biplot. E3 and E2 closely situated to D2 this is what I'm seeing in my GPA bin biplot. What we do see is variation in the sample points, which we don't see here. A lot of these samples on the left, just as a side note, have the same response patterns. That's where they are lying on top of each other. But the GPA bin biplot shows us some more variation, which is a very good thing if you um, understand the multiple imputation theory where you want to preserve or rather represent the uncertainty for using um, multiple imputation and working with missing data. The good thing here is that we are representing the associations that we can observe in the complete case. So this is the benefit of the GPA bin biplot. It produces an unbiased exploratory analysis when we are working with missing values. It preserves the relationships between samples and variables, and this refers to the proximity of our coordinates. It results in unbiased representation while incorporating the uncertainty, which we saw in those dispersed sample coordinates. So we have established the success of GPA bin using rigorous testing and an extensive simulation study with various parameters and confirmed that the GPA bin exploratory analysis is um, a successful technique to um, preserve the relationship and provide an unbiased visualization. So that is for the categorical case, of course, as we've discussed. We have started preliminary testing on extensions, on extensions, so for continuous data using the principal coordinate analysis by plot or principal component analysis by plot. That's a typing error, it's PCA. Sorry about that. And then compositional data is for the log ratio by plot. So we have extended this and it's looking very promising, but we still have to test it with simulation studies as well. So that is the first part, just to show you how to combine visualizations from multiple imputation. Then the last part is quite quick, <laughs> um, so don't stress. Um, Non-imputation approach is when we don't want to apply imputation techniques. So this could be something for a more non-technical user. Again, MCA is applied, but we're going to use subset, another typing error I'm spotting there now, subset MCA, SMCA. And in short, we're going to recode our indicator matrix and then apply MCA on the recoded indica indicator matrix. So suppose this is your data set, 10 samples, three variables, and they each have three category levels. And you can see that some of these responses are missing. So in our indicator matrix, we would have these rows or blocks that just have zeros. And this is a problem for MCA. You won't be able to complete the analysis. 
So for the specific application, we create an additional category level for each variable, which is the missing category level indicated by A question mark, B question mark, C question mark. So for every entry that has a missing value, we code that as one. So we're just expanding the indicator matrix now. And this enables us to subset, which means I can keep the missing category levels separate from the observed category levels. And this is exactly what it does. So if you want to just visualize your um, observed category levels, you can perform SMCA and just visualize the complete set. So this is a very short route, shorter route, of course. Um, again, the complete data set by plot. And on the right, we have the SMCA by plot now, recoding the indicator matrix and visualizing the observed subsets. Again, we see similarities. Um, remember, this only has 10% missing values, which is not regarded as a lot. Um, but again, we see the dispersion of the samples. Now we can see more variation in the horizontal dimension, whereas for the GPA bin bar plot, we saw the dispersion in the vertical direction. So there is a difference. Um, and if you compare them side by side in the middle, this is what we're aiming towards. We have our GPA bin bar plot on the right, SMCA bar plot on the left. So we can see similarities, but of course the success lies in how well the relationships are preserved. So how well the distances are preserving what we see in this middle by plot. So evaluating the approaches, you want to find a balance between what we call good fits, so representing the distances in the initial by plot, and then also you want unbiased representation. So we used various bias measures to confirm this and fit measures. And as I've said, we've tested this in a simulation study. So we've used various parameters to be able to confirm the validity of these methods. So this slide now just tells us to be careful. Don't compare SMCA directly to GPA bin. They are completely different. Of course, the one is enforcing multiple imputation and the other is just in a sense, ignoring the missing values by recoding that indicator matrix. So what we found is rather focus, of course, on when this, when the approaches are applicable and suitable. So low percentages of missing values, which we've investigated as 10%, show subtle differences between the methods. So they really obtain more or less the same measures of fit and bias. Generally, as your um, percentage of missing values increase, SMCA does not perform well. And there you should really perform a multiple imputation technique and then follow the GPA bin approach. Um, and as we saw in that one example, the SMCA shows dispersion in another dimension, um, which re reflected in poorer fit measurements. So both of them have benefits. The benefit of the GPA bin by plot is that you can still perform your superior imputation technique and visualize your data, since now you have the solution of an unbiased combined visualization. The benefit of SMCA really lies in the visualization of the missing subset. So not what you've just seen. I'm just checking the time again, because I really want to show you this last part, this last benefit. So just to kind of show you again, recap, this is the observed subset, the levels without the question mark, and then we have the missing subset. So now I'm going to visualize the missing subset using SMCA. And that is what I call the true benefit of performing SMCA. What you see on the screen here just shows you some visualizations for missing a data set. It's in the Amelia package. It's also in the reference list. It shows you where the missing values are in your data set. So it shows you the pattern of missingness, but it does not tell you the reason of missingness. So the MDM. Because looking at this visualization, we can't necessarily see dependencies between samples and responses, or rather non-responses. So we want to use biplots since this will tell us the association between samples and non-responses by again using the distances in the biplot. So we thought that there should be a difference between the distances or rather the patterns that we observe in a missing at random by plot versus a missing completely at random by plot because of the dependencies between samples and variables. So the idea for us was to say, okay, if there is a specific clustering structure that we can observe, this could be an indication of missing at random. 
because this could illustrate that there are associations between missing values and samples. Missing completely at random, this is the case where your missing values are independent of missing and observed. Here we thought, well, there shouldn't be any clustering structures because the missing values are independent. So this was the idea. To see if this is a plausible idea, we used just a very well-known or well-known technique partitioning around midwoids, PAM. So it's available in the cluster package, um, also in R. Um, and the idea here is, of course, there are various ways to approach this. We just wanted to see, is it a viable idea? So we used PAM. It gives you something they call the silhouette coefficient, and it's a value between negative one and one. And it basically tells you how well the clusters are separating. So there are no true benchmarks here, um, but they do, the original authors say, okay, a silhouette coefficient greater than 0 0.5 shows you the clustering um, structure is sufficient. So we said, okay, let's say missing at random will then have a silhouette coefficient above that benchmark value and missing completely at random, a silhouette coefficient below the benchmark value. So we investigated this. Here you see a 50% missingness. It, these techniques work very well as an example if you have a lot of missing, va uh, missing values. So here we had missing, res missing responses for four variables, B, C, D, and E. And I mean, we can already see, okay, there's a group there or a group of one, and then we have a group of three here. So there's a separation. And we want to confirm if we can separate the CLPs, so the missing um, category level points, from each other successfully, because that will maybe tell us if it's missing at random or not. So what we did is we asked Pam to cluster them into two groups, and we see the red group and the blue group. And this gives us a silhouette coefficient of 0 0.68. So it's above 0 0.5, showing that they are sufficiently separated. Then we said, okay, let's separate it into three which is obviously not successful. We have this green group, the blue group, and the red group, also reflected in the low silhouette coefficient. So here it is successfully separated using two clusters. So that's the idea behind our investigation. So we did this also for a full simulation study. And the idea here is to show you, on the three left panels, you see missing at random visualizations, and then the right, you see a missing completely at random. The details are not important here. I just want you to see that in the right panel, we always have this blob of sample points, and then we have a random pattern, so random scattered um, triangles, which shows no particular pattern. Whereas for the other panels, we could quickly group the triangles. So here we could group them in three again, one, two. So there are always a way to cluster a missing at random CLP, Whereas for a missing at random, a missing completely at random CLP, they are just completely random. So this was very exciting because it really confirmed what we wanted to see. Um, this is just showing you some of the simulation. I call this my waterfall plots. Um, let's just look at, I'm going to compare this one. I'm hovering over it. And then this last one. Maybe you can see that there is a horizontal line that is 0 0.5. So the silhouette coefficient of 0 0.5, which is our benchmark value. This one that I'm looking at at the top is a missing at random simulation. And we can see that these values are above the threshold value of 0 0.5. Now I'm going to the bottom one. Here we can see the missing completely at random simulations always or not always, but majority of them lie below the 0 0.5 line. Now this just shows us that there is a difference in the clustering structure of missing at random and missing completely at random mechanisms. So there's a difference. So if you want to know more about that, you can read about this in a conference proceeding that is also available online. What I want to tell you is there is a difference between the clustering structures, structures of these MDMs. If you select a specific number of clusters, as you will read in the paper, we've identified as a third of the missing category levels, you will be able to, with a certain amount of um, confidence, identify whether it's missing completely at random or missing at random. And we've changed that benchmark to 0 0.6 for our application because we found that a missing at random mechanism gives us a silhouette coefficient above 0 0.6 and not just 0 0.5. 
so to show you quickly in a real application how you and why this is important that's the part i didn't say is you can't just apply any missing data technique you know on any data set you need to understand why the values are missing so you first have to identify a plausible mdm so whether it's missing at random or missing completely at random and these techniques help you to do that so just a quick real application we have 11 variables with three category levels and i think this data set only had like nine percent missing values i unfortunately didn't include that now in the slide oh see i lied five percent overall missing data entries sorry about that so it's very low in any case so what we have on the right is the smca byproduct of the missing category levels and just with a quick glance, we can see we have one, two, and three groupings. Okay, but according to what we found that a third is the optimal separation, we have to separate this into four clusters, which gave us a silhouette coefficient of 0 0.58. So this is obviously very close to our cutoff of 0 0.6. And if we've clustered it into three, we would have obtained a higher silhouette coefficient. So the idea here is that we are confident to say, well, it's probably I'm saying confidence and probably in the same sentence, but query, we think it's a missing at random mechanism. And that is how you would use this technique. So to conclude, um, I showed you MCA for biplot visualization, multiple imputation, and then lastly, using it to identify the cause of missingness using subset MCA. My advice from this or the take home that you could do is you could use MCA biplots for your missing subsets to kind of understand the structure of your missing values, your non-responses. And then by using the biplot as I've shown you and performing a clustering technique, you can decide whether it's possibly missing at random or missing completely at random. Once you've decided on the mechanism, you can apply a suitable missing data technique. And then you could maybe, if you are into visualization, you can construct visualizations of your data sets if you have a plural there, so you've applied multiple imputation, please try the GPA bin approach. Thank you so much. And these are just the references that I refer to. Thank you so much on behalf of myself and the audience. We've got a great number of participants today, which is always wonderful to see. Um, and yeah, so everyone in the audience, I'd like to invite you now to come forward, please, with your comments and questions. Um, Yuana, if you can keep your presentation up just in case we need to refer to a specific slide. So while those questions are streaming in, I'll just quickly refer to the R packages. So the, the patterns that you saw, those three visualizations of the patterns, that is available in this Amelia package. Then the MIMCA algorithm for the multiple imputation is available in the MIS MDA package. The PAM clustering is available in cluster. The CA and MCA techniques, as I showed, it was in CA. And then if you want a package for biplots, it, this is the UB bubble, we call it. So the understanding biplots um, package. And it's also related to a textbook that you see there, just as an, an additional note. Um, you know, in terms of missing data, how broad is this, how broad is the research in this field? You know, in terms of research yeah. studies and 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 literature you can apply it everywhere i mean it's it's truly multidisciplinary and as i said anyone working with data must have encountered this in some way um and it's yeah very important to know how to deal with this um, i think like i said most people would just delete sometimes you could if it's really really a marginally small um, set of missing observations but i would always advocate to handle the data in an unbiased or the missing data in an unbiased way yeah, sure. Because I think, like, as you say, it's it's multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary because anyone doing a, a qualitative, a quantitative research study is going to have this, this significant, you know, the significance of this. They're going to have this appearance. I'm talking from my own research as well. Mm -hmm. And I have to be honest with you, it's never occurred to me before your presentation today to oh, consider okay. missing data it's 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 um, I'm currently in the middle of another research study and I'm kind of thinking I'd like to um you know implement this in some way um, um lloyd lloyd's asked if he can see the r book for biplot that you've shown on the last 
um, where there was yes. R passages. So the book, um, Lloyd, refers to this um, fourth reference, Gawa Libelaru, Understanding Biplots. That's the textbook. And then the package is the UB Bibble 40. That 40 refers now to the up upgraded version of R4. Um, but you need the textbook for the help files. So if you can maybe um, use both the, the package and this book, that would really help a lot. Okay, great. Because Charles has said um, he has it. He's actually was using correspondence analysis with lots of missing data. Oh, okay. Um, so again, on behalf of the center and our audience, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure um, to have you giving the seminar today. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And good luck with your um, research going forward.